DigitalJamSessions.com Hello and welcome to this Digital Jam special. We're here today with Oscar from Unity. And Oscar, why don't you explain a little bit more about what you do outside of Unity? Because there's such a big list. Yeah, I can't I, possibly. I, I, I do so many different things. And it's all kind of. So I'm an evangelist part time with Unity. I'm a co founder of a company called Rocket Lolly Games. We're making a game based on the Rocky Horror Show. And I do all sorts of consulting and mentoring and all sorts of other things like that. And speaking at lots of conferences about lots of things like monetization oh. and. Various other bits I'm and trying books. to write books. I wrote a book on games as a service. I'm supposed to be writing a book with my friend Bernie uh, about the psychology of game design as well. <laughs> Wonderful. And we're here today in the uh, lovely Beaufort Arms over at uh, Bristol, of all places. But what I wanted to do today is just have a little bit of a chat with you, Oscar, about something. We were having a little bit of a conversation about this, and I just felt like we needed to have a podcast about this. So, I'm going to start on, on the general term of, and I know you hate this, growth hacker. <laughs> yeah. But the context I'm going to give is this, which is, I've been speaking to a lot of people lately about VR and promoting, marketing, whatever you want to call it, their titles for VR. And there seem to be very few people who are commercially minded enough to think about having a clear growth strategy clear marketing strategy, understanding the differences between these things and understanding the value of existing techniques as well as new techniques for promoting their product or title. So I just wanted to drill down a little bit into this because I know that, that you have a lot to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> so for all, um, you know, for, just for clarity, mm. I'm not saying these things from completely you know, random thoughts. I am an MCIM, or well, it lapsed, I should say. I haven't paid the bill for <laughs> being a member for, well, Shh. 20 years or something <laughs> but I have my dip M so I am a mm -hmm. technically fully trained marketeer mm -hmm. but I am of the product marketing variety that mm -hmm. means that our job is to identify and satisfy consumer needs mm -hmm. as much as it is to run services and deliver experiences and market them so I mm -hmm. you know I, I like to think of product marketers as people who do the proper job mm -hmm. and then everyone else is Marcoms people who basically just sit in rooms and eat brown you know, sandwiches out <laughs> brown bags and have creative ideas and spend lots of money on TV ads okay not to upset <laughs> anybody we not like, to upset we like them all Obviously, I'm being just facetious for, for fun. <laughs> you know, it is a proper job. Both, um, and actually, the, the, my point really is yeah. that the whole term growth hack is basically people wanting to make marketing sound sexy. Mm -hmm. Fine. But it is, a, it is an important thing that you think strategically about how you bring an audience on board rapidly. Mm. And that, so that is fair from that point of view. But also, I think that there's this interesting kind of aspect when you talk about people using that phrase growth hacking and what does it really mean and, you know, is it really relevant? Well, it all that kind means of... pay me another £500 a day. Something along those lines. But the, the, the thing I find quite interesting is, is that part of the reason that, that it came about is because there was this kind of long-standing myth of marketing you know the smoke and mirrors of the marketing and people call it like dark arts or whatever you want to call it and this whole idea that everybody thinks they know about marketing because you know they, they know a little bit of yeah. something so therefore they all know about marketing if only it was dark arts i'd be some sort of mystical magician with a crazy hat and standing on stage oh, hang on, hold a minute, hold a <laughs> no, but i mean there is something about it i mean it's basics yeah. mm -hmm. it's i mean i know it's tedious but the four p's mm. you know product price place promotion or if i actually Got, kind of prefer to say people rather than product nowadays but that's mm. just me being really really consultancy sorry <laughs> I can't help it anyway the point is that this this take this tendency to try and strip mm -hmm. one part of the marketing mix mm -hmm. and focus purely on that I yes. think is dangerous yeah and, and I think this is what this is my real problem with growth hacking I don't have a problem with growth hacking as an mm -hmm. idea mm -hmm. yes okay here's an audience how do we scale to that audience yeah. how do we use you know smart vehicles yeah. that are non-traditional methods to mm -hmm. get to that smart audience how do we make our smart audience recruit more smart audience mm -hmm. that's all smart and it's called marketing <laughs> It's part of a broader strategy. But it's part yeah. of a broader strategy is the point. And uh -huh. the, the thing is, that if you are thinking about this strategically, this is why we need to stop being sales-minded uh -huh. and start being marketing-minded. Uh -huh. Sales-minded is saying, okay, the, the ad is getting me direct response, and that is the only thing that matters. I get an audience. I get the users. That's the only thing that matters. Uh -huh. And actually, to a large extent, uh -huh. in traditional mobile, that is true. Uh -huh. However, if you want to build a company, you also have to have a, a, a little bit of attention on the brand that you're building. And brand 
can build deeper and richer value if it's done in conjunction with smart Mm -hmm. growth hacks style direct response style user acquisition now it's interesting that you say this because from a vr perspective i'm not saying this from a games industry perspective i'm saying this very specific from a vr industry perspective at the moment there aren't a huge amount of studios who you could look at and just kind of go instantly i get who these people are i understand that they are a vr studio and i understand their brand there are a couple of standout names, but not a huge amount of them. Well, you know, Reflections, you know, End Dreams, you know, you know, I don't know, I've always the wrong company names there, but anyway, yeah. the, the point is that they are doing a really important thing. They are establishing their companies as fully functioning mm-hmm. teams with expertise. Mm-hmm. So they're brand building. Mm-hmm. And they're realizing that at the moment we have a relatively limited reach in terms of those devices that can support that and the audiences that are willing mm-hmm. to spend money. And they realize that the scope of the potential of what this, let's not call it a technology, but this experience mm-hmm. method mm-hmm. can be in the future mm-hmm. is vast. Mm-hmm. So they don't match up. Those two things don't match up mm-hmm. because we are in the early adopter stage. Mm-hmm. In fact, not, yeah, it is the early adopter stage, the innovator stage, if mm-hmm. anything. But that's it. Because it is still in that really early stage, and as you say, there aren't necessarily enough headsets out there for people to really be able to, to corner you know, a, a sizable market. Sure, you can get the, whole, you know, the majority of the market, but it's not a sizable market yet. And one of the things that I find quite interesting is this reliance on pe- people saying that they want to use VR advertising or looking for VR advertising platforms and I still think it's slightly too early for this because realistically the people you're advertising to don't have VR yet they haven't tried it that's true however I think actually this is a really important time for those companies to start up and obviously you know Unity are looking at this area as well and I'm not speaking for Unity when I say those things the crux is that we are in a space where the most effective way Mm -hmm. to get somebody interested in a new VR game is going to be from being within VR that's absolutely in the technology yeah without Ah. uh, so but that's about taking somebody who's already converted in some form even if it's Mm -hmm. just borrowing a device Mm -hmm. to and get them to do it again mm-hmm. and actually that's vital mm-hmm. we need to do more of that we need to excite and create anticipation delight and desire to act mm. and only you can only do that inside vr but, but you've got to get them into the device first yeah and that's the thing is that at the moment for people who are launching their, their titles for vr there's actually a kind of a dual responsibility it's not just about promoting the game so much as it actually actually is about promoting the format and the medium and getting people to be a aware of the medium and be willing to try it and then get involved with the game itself. I mean, it's, it's like they're trying to do two different marketing yeah, campaigns here. It, it is tough because at the end of the day, we, we're talking about a mm-hmm. function that would normally be done by the platform holder. Mm-hmm. And to a certain extent, is being done by the platform holder. Mm-hmm. O- Oculus and mm-hmm. Vive are doing... Samsung has some lovely Samsung, Samsung has amazing things. For, I mean, actually, mm-hmm. I think Samsung are, have done an, an incredible job mm-hmm. uh, in terms of making VR accessible to a large audience. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, it might be maybe slightly more simplified in some ways mm-hmm. than something that you could do on a Vive, but mm-hmm. it's still astounding. It still has that magic immersion moment. But you know, it, I don't think it's just about the technology. It's also about, as you say, the brand. And what I think that Samsung have managed to do with the Gear VR is actually to really articulate the brand. And so for a lot of mainstream consumers who have yet to try any type of VR, when you say VR, they they kind of think Samsung Gear VR. And that's not a bad thing. You know, they've obviously done a good job of kind of getting it out there to enough people to to get them to understand at least the concept of what VR should be. Yeah, and, it, and it's important to know that, you know, that's the only device that has millions of users. Mm. And uh, in this kind of market, you need a device that has millions of users. Mm. The I think why we're still lacking is we don't have a, a sense of kind of how to create habitual use. Mm. And I think that's really, you know, so there's a, there's a, con- a, con- there's a conundrum to be solved. Mm. There's a huge layer of getting somebody to have a device, getting Mm -hmm. somebody to put the device on, getting somebody to be excited about the game that they're going to put on this device that they've already owned, that Mm -hmm. they already got on their head, Mm -hmm. and then going on to buy something more. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we streamline all of those steps. Mm -hmm. But part of that is actually a very similar problem you have in any game. It's Mm -hmm. like, give me a reason to do it again. And how many game studios still to this day will go to something like the Big Indie Pitch or um, Indie Prize with a game which has a fantastic mechanic beautiful art and mm-hmm. no reason to play twice yeah and that's that's an interesting problem as well in, in as much as you're talking about getting people to come back and, and play again and yet there is still this perception issue around VR where you still have this this 
I'm not going to say, you know, it, it's necessarily a, a valid group, but you have a group of people who are talking about the dangers of spending lots of time in VR and, and whether or not it's safe and all this other stuff. And you know what? It kind of reminds me of back in the day of gaming. You know, oh, it's like yeah, games yeah. are evil. And they, they cause violence. It's, and, it's, you know. it's common. It's, it's the same problem that rock and roll had. It's yeah. like anything that's not... Exi- it, it, what's it? Someone's saying that anything, any technology that's invented before your 30 is uh, <laughs> considered amazing. Everything that's invented after your 30 is considered the devil's <laughs> work i mean okay it's oversimplification yeah. but we had a similar conversation i think last time i was on about the word experience mm-hmm. so there's some people who really hate the use of the word experience mm-hmm. for a vr game mm-hmm. whereas i love it mm-hmm. i actually prefer it in some ways mm-hmm. to talking about them as a game but no i don't mean that so i'm a games guy i love mm-hmm. games mm-hmm. i love mechanics and and context loops and meta games i love the whole mm-hmm. pr- paraphernalia of what makes a game tick in mm-hmm. the way it deals with our psychology mm-hmm. however i think there's something that vr does that's different mm-hmm. where yes it's the game first mm-hmm. but if you don't consider the whole experience mm-hmm. i think you're not really addressing the customer need properly mm-hmm. because i don't think we have a situation as I said before, that we have habit forming behaviors. Mm-hmm. And, and and the technology we have right now is mm-hmm. not the end goal. And we all know it. Yeah. And I think this is my biggest problem is that we're trying to address we're trying to solve today's problems when actually we should be getting ready for tomorrow's development. Yeah. But that you no know, one of the other things I find really interesting is is in the games industry, in my experience, I have found that, you know, when I've joined a new studio I often find that the commercial team has never played the game, never played the product that they're trying to advertise or market. The one thing I will say, though, is in VR, I don't find that happening so often. I find a lot of the people that work in in VR who are trying to promote a title have at least put something on their head and tried it. And I think that that at least is a a good first step in terms of making sure that we're, we're embedding the right habits from day one in terms of how people should be engaging with the product that they're going to advertise. I get you. So I, I, mean, I, I do some work, well, consultancy to sort of help a friend of mine, Nazar, from virtual arts occasionally. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, here's a guy who came out from arm, who's got a team, and he's specifically, even though he's a BD guy at mm-hmm. heart, mm-hmm. he specifically wanted to make stuff with VR and AR. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where we are. We've got these people who've got you know, tons of experience, track record and history and connections. But they just found something about this space mm. utterly delightful. And I mm-hmm. think it's because it's something that m- more profoundly changes the way we interact with, mm-hmm. with technology than any other medium that we've had so far. Yeah. And that is where we are right now. But you give it three years' time when we get to the point where we have devices which are much more convenient to use, mm. where we get to the point where we have content. content. Uh, whether it's content or, or, or whatever it is. I mean, I don't even think it's going to be that. I think it. I don't actually as long have as a it's clue. not a big heavy thing that but it would be visual computing in some form yes. you know and, and you know whatever that looks like that's going to have such a profound effect mm. on the way we behave mm. that they will have the natural you know, behaviours but unfortunately it will mean that we'll get the people coming along mm. who you know were 30 when the first thing came out and don't <laughs> want to play it yeah. and, but actually that's fine because that's not their job yeah. their job is to you know to do that connection and business um, you know contracts all that kind of stuff it's our job mm. as designers to make the thing happen designers and producers and all this mm. other stuff mm. because we ha- if we don't have a vision mm-hmm. to make tomorrow's content we are already lost so here's the thing we're talking about making tomorrow's content and what i want to do in closing is talk about the roles of, of tomorrow's vr studios mm. or vr companies whatever they may be in terms of the commercial team because I've heard a lot of phrases being bandied around and none of them are quite stuck yet within the VR industry. <laughs> whether that is growth hacker, whether that is no. audience development, whether that is, oh. you know, whatever the phrase is that people are using. And I just you want, <laughs> <laughs> whatever, user acquisition, yeah. whatever that thing is, I'm just kind of curious as to what we think are the relevant roles that need to be brought into the, the kind of VR fold as such. Because what I do find is for a lot of these studios, yes, they've got developers, yes, they've got you know CTOs, they've got all these key people. But when it comes to the commercial side of the team, mm. they might have a marketeer, they might have a CMO, but they don't have any specialisms yet. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think uh, the rise of the phrase chief revenue officer is quite yeah. interesting. Yeah. And often associated with people from the kind of influencer community and mm-hmm. the esports community, you know, and they're typically people who 
effectively are using not just business development type skill sets, mm-hmm. but also actual understanding of pricing strategy. Yeah. So price strategy doesn't necessarily just mean how much it cost. Mm-hmm. It means understanding what can you sell. Well, it's the economics of it as you well. It's the whole economics of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, that means understanding the data. It means understanding the audience. Mm-hmm. It means understanding what people value. Mm-hmm. I did this talk in DEFCOM in Cologne last week and it was nine ridiculous questions every game dev should ask Mm. one of the questions is what's the worst thing to deny your player Mm. and it sounds horrible why would Mm. you do that i mean Mm. how evil are you to say that but actually well for monetization purposes well you have to (laughs) you have to understand what it means yeah i don't say you have to charge on that thing Mm. but if you don't know what that thing is how do you know what people actually want yeah or yeah. are willing to pay for exactly and willing yeah. to pay for and that's willing to pay for is really vital because mm. uh, you know we're in a situation where most content right now in vr and mm. ar is going to be premium un- yeah. understandably yeah we don't know whether a freemium model will come i suspect it will mm-hmm. but, but but not in a does, clumsy way it yeah. has to come in a way that makes sense in the immersive state mm-hmm. if i go up to a back machine and takes the money out in a virtual world i expect that i can spend that virtual currency mm-hmm. in the virtual world i mean mm-hmm. maybe that's a bit too extreme but given as someone who was involved with playstation home mm-hmm. i do want to have an avatar walking around the space well, you know bit currency uh, yeah, exactly. you know, why, not? Uh, why not but what i will say is yeah. as always it's wonderful to have you on the show <laughs> in closing as always we'd like to ask you to uh share with us your social media handle of choice so that our lovely listeners can find out more about what you're up to yeah so you can find me on twitter at athanasius that's at a-t-h-a-n-a-t-e-u-s wonderful and thank you for joining us oscar and thank you for listening if you enjoyed this content don't forget to subscribe and review and follow us on twitter at digital jam ltd thinking of starting your own podcast why not speak to the GL Pro UK team? They handle all of our podcasting service needs. Tell them that Digital Jam Session sent you and you'll get 10% off your first order. Find out more at www.glpro.co.uk. DigitalJamSessions.com